Matthew chapter 11. Today being Father's Day, I wanted to preach a message to the men. And uh, I want to use an example on the Bible. John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist was not a father. John the Baptist did not have any children, uh, wasn't married or anything like that. However, many of the things that we see about John the Baptist are things that I think we ought to strive towards. We ought to strive to have these things in our lives. But look at what it says. I love what Jesus said about John the Baptist. The things that Jesus said about John the Baptist, I mean, he'd give him some great compliments. John the Baptist received some of the greatest compliments. He got mistaken for Jesus. You know, they were, they thought he was, some people thought he was Jesus. Some people thought he was Elijah. That's a really good compliment right there, too. I mean, one of the greatest Old Testament prophets. That's the kind of man he was. And all of us, Men, we ought to want to be good men. We ought to want to uh, do great things for God. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with striving for greatness and wanting to do good. We ought to have that. We have a very just passive generation of men that, you know, honestly, their greatest desire is to just beat the next Xbox game that comes out. You know, that's all they ever really accomplish. You know, they can't even whip cream, but, you know, they can beat somebody up on some fighting game on video games. So they think they're tough because of that. And it's like, you know, that's. That's ridiculous, but Matthew chapter 11, verse 7, look what it says. It says, And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitude concerning John, What went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind? But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in kings' houses. But what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet... For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So right here we see Jesus. He gives John a really good compliment. I mean, there's none born among women better than John. Jesus Christ would be the only person that was ever better than than John the Baptist. He was a great man, and I think we ought to learn some things about this man's life. But one of the things that is interesting about John the Baptist, you know, John the Baptist clearly was a strong person, a strong leader, a strong uh, individual, uh, very influential. He was the one that prepared people's hearts to receive the Messiah, to receive Jesus Christ. That was kind of his job. And this guy, John the Baptist, we see that when he preached, you know, he preached out in the wilderness. Okay, when you look at some of the things about John the Baptist, most of us would look at him thinking, you know, this guy's kind of crazy. But do you understand that this man, people would go out into the desert, they would go out in the wilderness to hear this man preach. There was something that attracted uh, people to this man. And Jesus, you know, he's asking the people, he's pointing out some things about John the Baptist. He's talking to the multitude and he's like, you know, what went you out in the wilderness to see? What made you, you know, leave the comforts of your home and go out in the wilderness to see this guy? What was it that drew people out there? He said, did you go out to see a reed shaken in the wind? I believe what it's talking about there, when it talks about a reed shaken in the the wind, a reed, it represents just a man of light and fickle mind. Some guy that just kind of goes all over the place. Somebody who, uh, maybe another term in the Bible, somebody who's carried about with every wind of doctrine. You know what? We need men who are strong in their convictions. We need men who know what they believe and they're willing to stick to it. I mean, they're going to do the right thing no matter what. John the Baptist, he wasn't scared of people. You know, he wasn't all, he wasn't all over the place. He wasn't wishy-washy. This guy was firm in his convictions. John, he didn't back down from his convictions. He would come and he'd get questioned all the time. You know, the Pharisees. You know, who's this guy that's out there that everybody's going to go listen to? You know, let's go, let's go find out this guy. He's stealing our influence. Let's go trip him up with our wisdom. And man, these Pharisees, these respected leaders, they go out there and John the Baptist would tell them off. John the Baptist would call him, you know, a generation of vipers. You know, he would tell him, you know, who had warned you to flee from the wrath to come. We'll see that in a little bit. But this guy, you know, John, he didn't care. He, he didn't back down. And, you know, it's sad how many people today, you know, they just back down for every little thing. How many men that just don't have a backbone? I mean, they, they're scared to death of their wives. All right? I mean, you know, and I, 
I can see some wives why you'd be scared of them, but you know, hey, listen, you ought, you ought to be able to stand up to them. You ought to be able to, you ought to be able to be strong. You ought to have some courage. I, you know, John the Baptist, he was a preacher. I can't believe how many preachers that are out there that just they have no backbone. I mean, just I mean, no, uh, no determination, no conviction. You challenge them on anything, and they just wimp out. And I, I don't like people like that. You know, I, I like people that are strong, that are bold. And they don't they don't care who they're talking to. Those are the kind of people I run with. Those are the kind of people that I hang around. People that aren't afraid. People that aren't afraid to tell me off. People that aren't. This, I've, there's preachers I know that I don't even agree with them everything doctrinally. But I respect the fact that these guys will tell me off if they think I need it. And you know what? While I might not care that much for their preaching, I'm all for them as a friend because I know, hey, this person is at least a man. Okay? But a lot of these trendy little sissies out there that just won't stand strong on anything, I, I have nothing to do with those people. I could care less about them. You know, I like, you know, what, hey, what do you believe? And they'll tell me. You know, oh, th- this is my preference. You know, no, tell me what's right. You know, tell me, tell me what you believe. Tell me what the Bible says. And John didn't do that. John was a man of conviction. And man, people, they came out to hear him. He could, he could handle the challenges. I'm amazed at how many preachers, whenever you challenge them on anything, run away. Literally. I mean, I've had preachers literally run away from me because they couldn't handle being challenged. They just, they don't, they don't know what to do with that. You know, they just can't, they can't even face somebody. You know, we need to teach our boys to be men. And they need to teach our boys, you know, even if, how to take some rebuke. And how to look somebody in the eye. And just be strong. Have some conviction. And John wasn't like that. He wasn't a reed shaking into the wind. He didn't just go with the flow. He didn't just do what everybody else does. He, went, he was a strong individual. And I believe God wants us men to be that way. I believe he wants us to have some character, have some determination. But another thing we see that Jesus mentioned about John, and I find this interesting, and I hope nobody has a problem with some of the things I'm going to say here. This is what Jesus said, all right? He said, what went ye out for to see? A man, in verse 8, a man clothed in soft raiment. Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. Okay, now what's that talking about right there? Well, if we look up the definitions of some of these words... And what it's talking about, I think we can find out, you know, a man in soft clothing, it means a man, one commentary I read, a feeble and effeminate character, unable to bear trials and hardships. Okay, let's, let's look at what John the Baptist wore first before we go into this. Look at Matthew chapter 3 and verse 1. It says, in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Okay, this was a pretty rugged individual. He wore some pretty rugged clothing. Now, there was a reason for that. The man... Preached out in the wilderness, okay? There's this, you're going to dress a certain way in the wilderness. I wouldn't wear this if I'm going to go out hunting, if I'm going to go out in the wilderness, okay? I believe that we ought to dress, you know, for the circumstances that we are in, okay? You know, when you're doing physical labor, you know, you, there's certain types of clothing you're going to want to wear that will help you, you know, that are going to help you in that. And John the Baptist, you know, he wore... You know, he, you know, he had a pretty rough exterior, wore the, you know, wore the leather, the camel's hair. It helped him being out in the wilderness. And he, Jesus said, did you go out to see some guy dressed in soft raiment? In soft, effeminate clothing? Some more things about that. You know, the kind of raiment here uh, denoted was the light, thin clothing worn by effeminate persons. It was made commonly of fine linen and worn chiefly for ornament. Okay, I, I don't believe that men ought to dress with ornaments. You know, we don't. We we the things that we wear ought to have a purpose. Now, I might be sound a little hypocritical because I'm wearing a tie right now. I still haven't figured out the purpose of a tie. All right. So yes, I, I maybe I've adapted a little bit to culture uh, myself. I haven't figured out the purpose of this, but you know, we shouldn't just wear things. You know, for ornament. Okay, I wear a wedding ring. My wife wants me to wear a wedding ring. Okay, it tells all the other women. You know, back off, I'm already taken, okay? So there's a, there's a purpose 
for the ring. Notice it doesn't have any diamonds or anything like that because I would lose them, all right? Because I, I wear it all the time. I wear a watch, but notice it's nothing fancy. Uh, you know, it's so I can know what time it is, all right? And, and you know, it, it serves a purpose. But you know, the clothes, but you know, when we start just decorating ourselves up with jewelry and doing the piercings and all these things, you know, what's the purpose of that? You know, there, there is no purpose in that. You know, the way some of these guys do their hair, you know, listen, guys, we don't do our hair. All right. You know, we, you know, we comb our hair, you know, we don't want to look like we just rolled out of bed, but you know, I'm not going to the beauty salon and getting a hair perm or anything like that. In fact, you know, one of the, ter you know, the terrible experiences in my life, my sister, she was going to beauty school to be a beautician. And so she had to do so many haircuts and all these things and she had to do it at the beauty school and so she wanted to start cutting my hair and she needed to do it there for it to count and so I went to go to the place where she you know did her training and everything and it was like a full-fledged beauty salon and I am and I'm in there and there's all these women in there you know getting their hair perm getting their hair shampooed and everything and I'm like the only guy in there and you know and here's the thing when it comes to those type of things women love that stuff all right, you know, women love the luxurious things, going and getting their nails done and their, you know, their feet pedicured and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, guys, I, I hope you guys, I hope you're disgusted by that kind of stuff. You know, I hope you don't enjoy that type of thing. Now, my wife does, and that's fine. But, you know, I'm in there, and all these women are having these things done, to, and you could tell they were loving it. I mean, they're just like in paradise getting their hair done, and I'm just, I'm sitting in there, and I'm like, I should not be in here, all right? I, I am not into these luxurious female things, and I absolutely hated getting my hair cut there. And I told her, I was like, you can keep cutting my hair for practice. I do not want to get my hair cut at that place. I felt too weird being, being in there. I, I, am not, I am not into that. And it just seemed, and if, you know, if there had been a guy in there enjoying that i'd have really been worried about that you know with women that's fine listen women are different there is nothing wrong with a woman being feminine absolutely nothing in the world wrong with that it's wonderful it's normal but when a guy is that way when a man is effeminate there is something problem you know in christ he asked them you know whether they were attracted by anything like that okay no there, there wasn't anything about that you know i hope as a as a man you know we you know our goal is not to have people talking about our clothes. Okay? You know, that's, we, we don't do that. We don't talk about fashion and styles and things like that. And, you know, if we do, once again, it's usually negative if we, if we are talking about that. But listen, nobody, got, nobody went out to go hear John because of how he was dressed. All right? And you see some of these guys, too, in these more modern churches, the way they're dressing. And they, do, they wear just these flashy, girly, effeminate. I've seen guys in Baptist churches preaching in skinny jeans and listen, you dress for what you are going to be doing, and there is no purpose in the world for skinny jeans, people. All right, there is no purpose in the world for that. There is, I have not, I can't even think of a reason. I can't think of one reason, but I don't want to mention it here in church because that's too disgusting, and we're not those type of people. But I'm telling you, it's nasty, it's disturbing when people dress that way, and nobody is attracted to somebody because of that. That's not why they went to go hear John the Baptist. You know, he wasn't like that. He, Jesus said the place to expect that is in the palaces of kings. You know, in the court of Herod, it might be expected, but not where John was. You're not going to see that out in the wilderness. You know, the, this kind of clothing, once again, you know, was of emblem of riches, splendor, effeminacy, feebleness of character. He meant to say that, you know, John, he was different than that. That's not how John was. John, he was dressed in a way fitted to endure trials and difficulties and he was qualified to be the forerunner of Jesus Christ and to be preparing the way of the Lord. And you know the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6:9 it says, "Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived neither fornicators nor idolaters nor adulterers nor effeminate nor abusers of themselves with mankind, effeminate." Once again, acting like a woman or unmanly Hey, ladies, don't take it wrong. It's wonderful when you act like women. But when a man acts like a woman, that is wicked. God hates that. And God put effeminate men in bad company. You know, with idolaters and adulterers, you know, abusers of themselves with mankind. That is bad company to be in. 
And that term effeminate, it, it's actually disturbing when you study the meanings of some of these words, what it means to be effeminate. But one of the, uh, the, the terms it used was in the uh, Greek dictionary was academite, which I didn't even know what that was. I had to look that up. And if you look that up in the Webster's 1828 dictionary, it talks about a boy used for unnatural purposes. And in the modern dictionary, they've changed that definition to make it not sound as bad because we all, I mean, homosexuality is prevalent in our society today. And listen, they don't like to admit this, but it's coming out more and more about them. I was very, uh, that, you know, the next thing they're going to be adding to the LGBTQ community is they P for pedophilia. And these people believe in it and they are for it. And I, I'm so glad this one guy, everybody talked about him like he was great, that Milo, uh, you know, Mistopheles or something. He had some like weird Greek name. And he was like a conservative Republican and he was a homo. And everybody's like, oh, isn't this great? You know, homo, you know, a good conservative homo. Well, then they found out the guy in some interview was talking about basically how he thinks pedophilia is fine. And so now he's discredited because of that. But listen, that's what they all believe. Just he was honest enough to admit it. And, you know, we shouldn't respect people like that. And you know what? That guy wore soft clothing. Now, that guy was effeminate. And I don't know why anybody listened to him. I mean, that was just ridiculous. But listen, that people who dress in that way and act in that way, that is wicked. It is disgusting. And it has become very prevalent in our society today. And you know what? Jesus said John the Baptist isn't one of those people. He's not like that. Nobody's going to go out in the wilderness to see somebody like that. Nobody, ca nobody cares about somebody like that. You know, um, one of the, the commentaries are right on that too, it's, or about being effeminate, is having the qualities of the female sex. Soft or delicate to an unmanly degree. Tender, womanish, voluptuous, which means given to the enjoyments of luxury and pleasure. Once again, that guy that you see in the nail salon. Okay? I don't think we ought to go beating those people up, but we ought to want to beat those people up when you see that. I'm telling you, that's just wrong when people are into that and enjoy those things. And I'm telling you, we shouldn't be that way. People are, they're getting softened up with these things. Yo, young boys today, it's amazing how soft they are. They can't handle any work. I'll never forget at Emily's graduation, they had to have it outside at Rock Falls. And it was kind of hot and sunny that day. And we're out there in the sun, and, you know, it's normal. We, you know, it was real crowded. We didn't have a seat. Me and some of the kids were just standing there watching. And as the ceremony went on, I was noticing all these people, like, having to leave because, you know, the kids were, like, practically, you know, dying. And, and just, I'm not kidding, every few minutes, you would see, you know, some mom or some grandma who looked absolutely fine Carrying this, you know, beet red, you know, just doughboy kid that you can tell has never been out in the sun in his life, you know, because he just couldn't handle it out there in the elements. I mean, just, you know, every, I mean, you would just your stereotypical video gamer kid, just every few minutes, one of them's bringing him out because they can't handle sitting out in the sun. Well, you know what? Men ought to be able to work out in the sun and sweat. And it's like these people, man, what, what's this? fluid coming out of my head you know what's going on I, i've never experienced anything like this before yeah it's called sweat and you know what you know oh, i'm having the problem getting shaken. Like, drink some water you know you got these and then you got these kids these little kids their parents they give them every little thing they want they're always eating ding-dongs and ho-hos and drinking soda and then you know they wonder why their kids are having all these health problems and things and listen you need to, you need to teach them to be a man you need to teach them to toughen up you need to teach them to go outside and do some work. You know, if whether you, you know, go tell your kid to dig a hole if you have to. All right. You know, if you have a little yard, go tell them to dig a hole and then fill it back in. They need to know how to do some work. They need to know how to get dirty. They need to know how to get sweaty. They need to be able to handle things because if they don't learn those things, they're going to become soft and effeminate. They're going to start enjoying those pleasures. They're going to get used to, hey, this is kind of nice just sitting around playing video games all day. That's a big danger in the summer. For boys, you know, school's out and, you know, they're not in P.E. And anymore. The only place they ever get any physical education. And even P.E. in schools, they pretty much just have them power walk anymore. They don't have them do, hardly do anything. Coaches aren't allowed to throw basketballs at the kids' faces anymore. You know, they can't play dodgeball and stuff, you know, where somebody could get hurt. They need that stuff. 
Okay? Boys need competition. They need to go out and they need to play a game and they need to, they, if they get beat, they need somebody making fun of them because they got beat. So it'll light a fire under them so they will work harder and try harder. And they need somebody pointing at them and calling them a loser so they will, they will do better next time. And I know this is politically incorrect and I'm just kind of ranting on a rabbit trail right here, but we need this in our country today. Boys today are soft and effeminate and pathetic and we wonder why they can't handle anything in life. You know, they grow up and they get older and they start to mature. They start having that desire for the physical relationship. But then they don't, but they're not taught any character. They're not taught about how you're supposed to get married first. And then after you get married, you know, you end up having kids. And then you know what? When you have kids, there's going to be challenges that come. There's going to be financial challenges. There's going to be financial hardships. There's going to be things that you're going to have to deal with that are difficult. And you have these little Fauntleroys that just never dealt with anything. Mommy and Daddy gave them everything they ever wanted in their whole life. And then challenges come their way. And what do they do? They give up. They quit the marriage. They quit. They, they, they won't take care of their kids. They're not good dads. They don't know how to handle any challenges. And listen, this all goes back to you spoil, spoiling that kid. Shoving all that sugar down his throat just because he yelled for it. You know, buying him all those video games because you felt like you were a sorry parent and you felt like you'd be a good parent if you always kept him, you know, up to date with the latest and greatest video games. And you did, you, you ruined that kid. He is now soft. He is effeminate. And then we wonder too why people are going into all this perversion. And it's, it's ridiculous. And we cannot do that. We can't let that happen. We need strong men. What are we going to do if the grid, you know, if uh, they ever do the EMP and we lose power? You know how fast people are going to start dying? I mean, they're going to die so fast just because, not because they don't have electricity, because they don't have television. I mean, what are these people going to do when their cell phone battery dies and they can't recharge it? They're going to start having mental and emotional breakdowns. They're not, going to be able to, they're not going to be able to handle it. So you know, we need to start preparing them for these things. You know, have them do challenging things because they need it. And being effeminate, it is. It's, it's wicked, and we need to stay away from that. And John was not like that. Jesus said, you know, they, they're in king's houses. Those people living in all the luxury, those people that just have everything that wear the fine clothing, that's not what John the Baptist was. He ate locusts and wild honey. He wasn't eating the little Debbie cakes and all those other, and McDonald's and all those other things that everybody you know enjoys today. It, that he you know and it, it it's it is it's so amazing how spoiled kids are. You know I appreciate what Michelle Obama tried to do with the whole getting healthy food into the schools and stuff. And you know instead of having candy bars in the vending machines, you know put vegetables and stuff in there. But listen, it's about the home. It's not about the schools. And when the parents in the home are feeding their kids all that junk, listen, once you, when you've ate a ding-dong, carrots just aren't going to matter anymore. <laughs> you're not, you're not going to care about those things. Once you drink soda, why would you drink water anymore? You know, why would you drink water anymore? And you do, when you are constantly giving your kids all these things, they're going to get used to it. And they're going to expect it all the time. And it, it is, it's, it's ruining people. And so we need, we, need, we need to toughen our kids up, especially our boys. You need to toughen them up. You need to let them endure a challenge. It, you know, dads, if your boy's out and he gets hurt and he gets a boo-boo and he's crying, you, know, you need to tell him to tough it up. Be a man. You know, mom can kiss him later, you know, at, but you need to encourage him to just tough it up and be a man and deal with it. That, that's, part, that's, part of being a, that's part of being a dad. And, you know, and, and thank God. You know, thank God for moms and dads. That's why we need both. Okay, you know, Jason had that experience last year, or the year before, where he broke his wrist uh, falling down the stairs, playing a game I had taught him that was pretty rough, and you know, and we didn't know it was broke. Never took him to the doctor or anything. And then after he got back, you know, he's holding up drywall. You know, we're working. You know, a few days later, and he fell again off the bucket, and and then Cassandra decided, you know, he needs to go to the doctor, and it was a good thing because it was broke. Uh, you know, but. Um, <laughs> You know, and then last year too, it's always bad when she, whenever stuff happens is when she's gone. Last year when she was gone, Jason had 
this all of a sudden he started having this growth on his body. You know, we didn't know what it was. And Jason's a pretty gross character, uh, you know, but he does a lot of that boyish stuff, but we didn't really do anything about it. And then uh, Tommy sent a picture to Cassandra showing this rash. It was like on his back and stuff. And then she was just like, get him to the doctor now. So I took him to the doctor and it was a good thing because it turned out it was a staph infection. Uh, it was, he had got it just what he was doing to tasseling and walking out in the corn and the, and being wet all the time. And he just got a, rash got infected and it's a good thing mom was there for that but you know what at least i was there to toughen him up make him deal with it for a while so he got cured all right he's fine nothing happened but he got toughened up a little bit in the process but because mom was there too he didn't die either so that's why that's why god gave both all right that's why that's why we need both so he's going to be tough and he's going to survive and so anyway but john the baptist so he did, you know, he, he stood out in his appearance. He didn't dress flashy or even in a flattering way. It was a way that was fitting for where he was and what he was doing. He was out in the wilderness. And, you know, and that, you know there's nothing wrong with dressing nice as a guy and looking nice. But you know what? You know, these, you know, most real men, they're not going to go spending hundreds of dollars on a pair of pants and things like that. You know why? Because we know we're going to destroy them because we work. You know, we do physical things, and so we're going to go get we're going to go get the cheaper stuff. We're not going to dress in these flashy ways, wear ornaments, things like that. And so, look at verse nine. What it says about John? It says, "Oh, I'm back in chapter three, uh, back in chapter eleven. In verse nine, it says, "But what went you out for to see a prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee." Verily I say to you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven, is greater than he. Okay? John the Baptist, not only was he a prophet, he was more than a prophet. In fact, he was the best there ever was. The best that there ever was. You know what? I know we're trying to get rid of the competitive spirit in boys today, but you know what? It ought to be in us that we ought to want to be the best at what we do. There's nothing wrong with wanting to be the best in your job or in your field, whatever your ability is, whatever you're doing, if you have a desire to be the best and to beat the competition, there's nothing wrong with that. If your kid plays sports and he wants to beat the other team and he wants to beat them bad, you know, don't, don't downplay, don't discourage that. You know, motivate that. There's nothing wrong with wanting to be good at something and wanting to be the best. You know, it's like we celebrate mediocrity in our country. We actually, we celebrate failure more than we celebrate success in our country today. But John, he was the best at what he did. And notice when it came to John, John didn't care about the size of his audience. John preached in the wilderness, didn't he? But you know what? John would get a multitude to come out to hear him in the wilderness, didn't he? You know, with John, it was just about doing what God wanted to do. And he, if he would have been about himself, if he'd have been about the audience, he would have been in the cities, wouldn't he? But he didn't do that. He went out in the wilderness. He went wherever God wanted him. He would go places where there was much water so he could baptize people because that was what he was supposed to do. And you know what? You know, if you're gonna if you're gonna start a business, if, nothing wrong with wanting to be the best at it. Nothing want, wrong with wanting to be successful at it. You know, when we started this church, I wanted to start a church in Illinois. You know why? Illinois is where I'm from, one, and our state stinks. Our state's got the most corrupt government. I mean, our our state's terrible. And you know what? I'm not insulting anybody here. I think y'all are great people. But you know what? This community is not that great either. This community's got some issues. You know, read the police report sometime. You know, look at you know look at some of the demographics around here and the way you know uh, the you know the amount of welfare that's in an area our size is is crazy. It's ridiculous. We ought to be embarrassed by that. But you know what? I didn't want to go start a church somewhere where everything's great. I don't want to go start a church that's already got you know a zillion other great churches. I want to go somewhere where it's needed, and I want to accomplish something here. You know, most people if they're going to try to build a great big church, you know, they're going to go into some big metropolitan area somewhere. No, I'd rather do it out here. This is where God called me. I want to do it here, out in a rural community, in a smaller area. This is where God wants me, and I want I want to do it here. And there's nothing wrong with wanting to be the best at what you do. I want this to be the best church. In the world. I agree. But, you know, we still got more proof that we got to do. But you know, we're, but we're going to keep on, we're going to keep on going. We're going to keep on going with that. And th- there's nothing wrong with that. Okay. It's not that we're 
just going around saying we're better. We just want to be the best that we can possibly be. And if we get a little competitive while doing it, you know what? That's just part of being a man. And, you know, we're not going to just, and don't discourage your boys from that. You know, teach them to be good sports. You know, they don't need to go rubbing it in other people's faces. You know, you need to teach them that when you win, act like you've won before. You know, I'm always talking about these Twitter preachers that are out there that are always bragging on Twitter about stuff. And, you know, and I see these preachers every once in a while. You know, to me, when you have, when you take a picture of yourself out soul winning, that tells me you don't go soul winning very often. When you take a picture of somebody that you led to the Lord, it tells me you don't lead that many people to the Lord. That's what these things tell me. When you do, when you have to promote yourself like that and praise yourself that way, that tells me that accomplishment is very rare for you. Because I'll see some of that too, and it's like, you know, I, I mean, I'm not a tour about it. I could be showing that stuff too, but those things aren't that big of a deal for me. But it is for a lot of these people because they really don't accomplish that much. And so they're trying to convince everybody, listen, I don't need to report to the world every good thing that happens out here. Because, you know, it's enough for me that I know what's going on. It's enough for me that, that you know, I, I, I'm seeing what God's doing. I don't need to show it off because it, that's just about lifting myself up. And, you know, John, he didn't care about that. John the Baptist showed up where he needed to be and he did what he was supposed to do and he did it and he did it good. And he, and he impressed the only one that really mattered. It was Jesus Christ. Because what did the world do to John the Baptist? John the Baptist ended up getting his head cut off, didn't he? But you know what? He impressed Jesus Christ and that ought to be our goal. But John, he was, he was interested. You know, John didn't hold back the truth from anyone. John told it like it is. Look at cha- back at chapter 3 again uh, in verse 5. We, we read to verse 4, but look what it says in verse 5. It says, Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. Man, you know, why, why do you think they were confessing their sins? Well, I think it's because John had just been preaching on their sins. He had been pointing out their sins. And then verse 7, But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to the baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? You know what he did to them? He did the same thing to these leaders as he did to everybody else. He pointed out those people's sins, and then he pointed out the Pharisees and Sadducees' sins. And he didn't care. He did not care who it was. It didn't matter who, who was around. His job was to be a preacher of righteousness, and that's exactly what he did, whether he was preaching to the common man, whether he was preaching to the religious elite, and whether he was preaching to the king himself. And look what it says in chapter 14, in verse 1. It says, At that time Herod the Tetrarch heard of the fame of Jesus and said unto his servants, This is John the Baptist. He is risen from the dead. Therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. Herod thought Jesus was John the Baptist. Once again, that's a really good compliment right there when you get mistaken for Jesus. John the Baptist did. And, but for Herod, because he thought John the Baptist had risen from the dead, for Herod had laid hold on John and bound him and put him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife. For John said unto him, It is not lawful for thee to have her. And when he would have put him to death, he feared the multitude because they counted him as a prophet. We see in that story that John the Baptist had told Herod the king, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. He had married his brother's wife. That was against God's law. And John said that to the king. What was he thinking? You know what he was thinking? That's my job. I'm a preacher of righteousness. I'm going to preach to everybody. I don't care who they are. And he did. Didn't matter who was around. He did it right there to Herod. And you know what? That made Herodias, the wife, mad. And you know what? Herod, he's kind of an opposite of John. Herod's the one. He is the king. He's in the king's house. He's probably wearing the soft raiment and he couldn't even handle his wife. And just because a guy preached on him and got in his sin, she, Herod went, or Herodias gets her daughter to dance for him. It pleases him. And then she made that deal with her mom and she goes and tells Herod, I want the head of John the Baptist in a charger. And Herod was sad. He knew that was the wrong thing to do, but he didn't have the guts to tell his wife, I'm not doing that. And what did he do? He went and killed a just man because he was a wimp and John the Baptist, he didn't care. I I think he probably went, was preaching till he got his head cut off. 
You know, John the Baptist, he, he said it didn't matter. He was a man. He was the same all the time. He didn't hold back the truth from anyone. And we need to be that way. We need to have conviction. We, and we need it. Whatever it is you do, whether it's a carpenter, you ought to want to be the best carpenter. If you're an electrician, you ought to want to be the best electrician. Mechanic, you ought to want to be the best at what you do. That ought to be your desire. That should You need to instill that in your boys to be the best at what you do and be successful at it. Be consistent. Be fair with everybody. You know, Treat everybody in the right way, in the same way. John the Baptist did that. And we see that when it came to John the Baptist, while he's the best there ever was next to Jesus Christ, John's his leadership that he had, it clearly was not about himself. Look at what it says in John chapter 3 and verse 26. I love this passage of Scripture. It says, they came, unto, they came unto John and said to him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except to be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. He must increase but I must decrease. Y'all see that Jesus, after Jesus came on the scene, John started becoming less and less significant. Some of John's disciples ended up becoming disciples of Jesus. The multitudes that used to come listen to John were now going to listen to Jesus. But y'all realize that was exactly what was supposed to happen? John understood his place. John understood his position. And it was never about John the Baptist. It was always about Jesus Christ. And then when these people come along telling them, hey, more people are following Jesus than you. You know, this, the reason they did that is because they were probably thinking this is going to tweet John. This is going to make him mad because that's why they, the Pharisees hated Jesus. Because people quit coming to the Pharisees with all their questions and they started going to Jesus. And you know what? That got them all bent out of shape because they were proud. They were arrogant. And they, did, they, had, they had a problem with competition. And let me tell you something about real men. Real men don't mind a little bit of competition. You know, it's sad how many preachers that are out there that just can't handle if somebody in their church is influenced by another preacher out there. And then they got to make it their mission to destroy that preacher. Listen, if that preacher is wrong, if he's preaching something that isn't true, you prove him wrong from the scriptures. You can't handle competition though, can you? You can't handle any type of outside influence because you have no confidence. Because you're wrong. You know, because you just you don't have the ability to speak clearly and teach the truth. Listen, if you all are listening to other preachers, if they're a false prophet and they're teaching you lies and you bring these things up to me, I'll just blow it out of the water with the Bible. And if I can't do that, I'm a crummy preacher. If you're preaching somebody else, you're listening to somebody else and they're preaching the truth, great then they'll just back me up. That'll just be one more thing confirming what I'm saying. I'm not scared of that. And I, it's, it's interesting to me, all these preachers that are out there, they are always got to be bad-mouthing these guys. Ones, too, that aren't even that bad. To me, it's just because, you know what? More people are now listening to them instead of listening to you. And if that person's preaching the truth, who cares if they're going to them instead of you? As long as the people get the truth, we should be happy. Yeah, maybe somebody's church, they might get, you know, maybe it's somebody else in the area. If they come in, if they're preaching the truth, their church might get bigger. The competitive side of me might start to say, oh, I, got, I got to do something about that. But here's the thing if they're preaching the truth and people are getting saved, I ought to be thrilled about that. Because ultimately, this is not about Liberty Baptist Church or Pastor Tommy McMurtry. It's about Jesus Christ. And that's how John the Baptist worked. That was how he was. He said, He must increase, I must decrease. That is an impressive attitude right there. John the Baptist didn't see Jesus as competition. He saw, hey, I'm on his team. John the Baptist actually saw it, what Jesus' success is his success. Because it was his job to get people following Jesus. The fact that he was doing that good, I mean, that showed that he had succeeded. And you know what? Ultimately, what ended up being John the Baptist's greatest attribute was how much he was like Christ. The fact that he was mistaken for Christ, Jesus was mistaken for John the Baptist, 
John was mistaken for Elijah. I mean, that to me is the greatest thing. And when it comes to Jesus and John, they were both either loved or hated, weren't they? Both of them ended up being put to death. They either had loyal followers or they had mortal enemies. You know, and both, they were both put to death. But one of the biggest problems with men today is, you know, they, you know, they try to lead without ever making any enemies. It's like they're trying to live this life. I don't want to ever make anybody mad. I don't ever want to make my coworkers mad. I don't want to make my neighbors mad. I don't want to ever make my wife mad. You know, they, they just, they, they're not willing to just do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. And we see that the two greatest men that ever lived, number one, Jesus Christ, number two, John the Baptist, they ended up being put to death. But you know what? The truth is you can't be a leader without having enemies. You can't do, you're not going to be able to do the right thing in this wicked world unless you're willing to go against the flow. You're willing to swim upstream. That's what we're up against and that's what we have to do. And we need men like John the Baptist leading homes, leading our churches, leading our, our community, leading our, our nation, men of strong character, men of strong conviction. And John the Baptist is a great example of that. And we, do, we need to try to follow that the best we can. Don't get caught up into this, you know, no competition. Let's all be soft and gentle and effeminate. No, that is, that's wicked stuff right there. That's the very opposite of the kind of men that we're supposed to be following and so be a man of strong conviction. That's the best thing you could, as a father, that's the best thing you could ever do for your son. It's to give him, be an example of that. So he will be the same way. And he can turn out and be a real man of God. And so with that, let's all stand together.